I'm glad to be back. I know Michael mentioned the, that he was glad, but uh, I am as well. We went to polishing the pulpit, and it truly was a great time. It was, well, so many lectures, so many different topics, and it's very uplifting to be a preacher and to hear other preachers um, who have put so much work into what they're doing and, and uh, these uh, their unique lessons and valuable. Now, one thing, uh, I'm glad to be welcomed back by all except for the, uh, the pollen. It seems that if you leave Memphis or the Memphis area for a week and you come back, your body doesn't remember that there's pollen here and you have to acclimate yourself again and, and now my throat is a little sore and my, my nose is stuffed and, and simultaneously stuffed and running at the same time. And, you know, Memphis didn't want me to leave, so it's punishing me for, for leaving. It really is glad to have me back, I guess, or the, the, this area. We have, for our consideration today, uh, Romans chapter 15. Michael talked about Genesis 15, so I'll be talking about Romans chapter 15. And uh, Romans 15 is uh, the second to last chapter in the book. And there are uh, a few things in chapter 16 that, that Paul uh, has to, well, he wraps the book up with. And uh, really, the, the doctrinal part finishes in chapter 15. And he starts talking about how he wants to visit Rome. He has plans to, to come to Rome he, in verse 24, it's, he says that he's going to take a journey into Spain. And, well, we don't have indication from the scriptures that he ever did that, but it's very possible that um, during his period, you know, during the, the time that he spent in Rome, he, he might have been able to make a trip over to Spain before he returned to Rome and was imprisoned again. Uh, so Romans 15 has a, a number of those things, but I want to focus on the first seven verses of Romans chapter 15. And, uh, well, th these, these verses continue to build on the thoughts that you see in chapter 14. And, and chapter 14 uh, addresses, well, verse 1, I'll, I'll read it. It says, Him that is weak in the faith receive you, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believes that he may eat all things, another who is weak eats herbs or vegetables. And there would be, I can imagine a, a couple of instances where, where this would happen. It could be, uh, as is mentioned in the book of 1 Corinthians, somebody who has a hard time eating meat that is offered to idols. Um, that would be potentially a, a scenario where one wouldn't want to eat meat and uh, it could also be a Jew who has a hard time breaking the Jewish dietary restrictions. Uh, one believes that he may eat all things, including that, that pork that, well, you grew up not being able to eat. And another, he doesn't want to do that. So th there were some dietary concerns based on people's view of spirituality. And, and their view of, of following God. Now, we know from the scriptures that neither one matters. And in 1 Corinthians 4, or in, in Romans 14, he says it doesn't matter if you eat the, eat the meat or you don't eat the meat. For example, if you eat pork as a, as a former Jew, there's, there's nothing that's going to be wrong with that. Because God has made that clean. Similarly, if you as a former Gentile eat meat that is offered to idols, once again, God doesn't mind that that meat came from the temple. There's, it's just meat. And, and as a Christian, knowing that an idol is nothing, there's nothing to hold you back from that. But still, people had difficulty going through with that. Their conscience wouldn't allow them to do that. 
And I, I know with, with Romans chapter 14, these, these scruples that people had against doing these things, in, in chapter 14, it, it says in verse 23, he that doubts is damned if he eat, because he eats not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And as I have considered that, I wonder, well, how, in, how is he condemned if he eats something where it doesn't matter? And I think it has to do with the fact that when you eat something like this and it's going against your conscience, you are intentionally doing something that you believe to be wrong. Uh, even if it's not necessarily wrong to eat this meat... When you eat of it, you're doing something that you believe to, to do wrong. So there is intention there then to do what is wrong. And, and I wonder if that's not the reason why he says that the one who, is, who doubts is condemned if he, he actually eats it. So as Christians, we're not to push the issue. We're not to see somebody who has a problem with this. And, it's, and, and maybe it is because of where they came from. Maybe it's because of something that they came out of where this thing was given a religious significance. There are certain things that, that we know don't have religious significance, but other people give them religious significance. And somebody who comes out of a religious group that... that applies religious significance to certain things, when they come into the church, they may have a difficult time just saying, oh, well, it's not religious at all. Now, does this make them, you know, how does this make them weak? It talks about the, the one who is weak in the faith, and it says, receive the one who is weak in the faith. Well, that weakness is not to be taken as an insult. It's not to be taken as somebody who is less valuable in the faith, and it's, it's not even... Uh, as you look in here, it's not even to indicate somebody who needs to change that belief about this. Now, there may be people who have false views about certain things. Like, for example, uh, somebody, somebody may think that it's, it's wrong to partake of the Lord's Supper using more than one cup. And they believe that because Jesus says, take this cup, uh, take this cup, well, then, then you, you, know, you can't use more than one cup. It's interesting that in the same passage, it says Jesus it told them, divide this among yourselves. You know, it's kind of hard to divide something in one cup, so maybe they poured it into multiple cups as well. Uh, but there are people who believe this and, and they say, well, I, I just have this scruple and therefore you shouldn't, you shouldn't do this. And there can be a way where we can misuse th these ideas. It's not just anything that somebody thinks is wrong. I can think that it's wrong to, um, I can think that it's wrong to do any work on Saturday. Because, well, that's, you know, Jesus, or, or because the, in the Old Testament, they observed the Sabbath. And I can't expect everyone else not to work on the Sabbath day because, well, somebody who has a, somebody who has a, a proper understanding of the New Testament scriptures understands that those laws in the Old Testament have been done away with. The don't work on Saturday law or don't work on the Sabbath day law, that that law in the Ten Commandments was never restated in the New Testament. Therefore, there is no, uh, there's no um, commandment for us to follow. Similarly, with dietary restrictions, there's no commandment for us to follow. You can eat this meat, but you can't eat this meat. Or, uh, but during this time, during the time when Paul wrote the book of Romans, you had individuals who were coming out of various different religious practices. Some Jews coming out of Judaism with dietary restrictions and some Gentiles coming out of paganism where the meat offered to idols was significant and they had an issue with eating these things. Now what do we do with people like this? 
Well, in Romans chapter 14, Paul says, don't make it an issue. Well, why do I mention all of this? I'm supposed to be talking about Romans chapter 15, and I just spent the first 10 minutes giving you the background. Well, it's important. Because verse 15 starts with, we then. What's then? What does the word then mean here? It's like the word therefore. It's, summing, it's, it's summarizing what everything that Paul outlined in Romans chapter 14. Because there is this issue and because there are these people who see this, this meat as something that you know, they cannot do without it having religious significance, we should, who are strong, bear the infirmities of the weak. And not to please ourselves. Who's right in this situation? Who's right in this situation? Is the the strong brother or the weak brother right? I'd say both of them are. Both of them are right because... In Romans it says, he's condemned if he eats. So because of the intention that he has, and because of the religious significance that he knows was once placed on doing this thing, he's right in avoiding it. What about the strong brother? You know, we tend to think, well, strong is right and weak is wrong, but... It's not the case in this scenario. The strong brother is one who, he can, he can eat that meat and there's nothing religious about it. Why? Because, well, maybe he didn't, maybe he didn't come from that, that Jewish background, which had the, the, the dietary laws. Or maybe he was just a bad idol worshiper. I don't know. He never went to church as a pagan. Or maybe he just understands, just realizes, you know, now there's no significance here. And it seems that there was a lot of potential for problems between these two people. Because one says, well, you can't do that. You know, I can't do this because, I, you know, I came from Judaism. And, and then the other says, well, we know that, that it doesn't matter if you eat pork. Or uh, talking to a pagan, we know that there's nothing in an idol, and, and they could dispute and argue. And one says, well, I need to be right. And the other says, well, I need to be right. Well, guess what? They're both right. And in 14, he says, you're not eating because you want to give glory to God. And then you're eating because you want to give glory to God. Both of you are doing what you, what you do so that you can give glory to God. And you know what? God is glorified by both. So the strong one, bear the infirmities of the weak. Help them. Show some understanding. It, you, you don't have to be right in everything. There are some situations where... You know, there are some situations where the, there's, there's no need to assert yourself or to, to be right about certain things. And once again, we're not talking about doctrinal issues. If somebody comes and says, well, I don't believe that you have to be baptized to be saved, we'll have an issue, won't we? And I'm not going to let you stand up in front of everybody here and tell people that without standing up behind you and saying, that is wrong. Why is that? Well, because there are certain things that, that God talks about that we have to affirm and that we have to believe. What if somebody got up and says, well, Jesus isn't the Messiah, the Son of God. He was just a prophet. What do you do with that? 
You have to dispute about that, don't you? Paul, he went into the synagogues and he disputed with people about the deity of Christ. But there are some issues. There are some issues like this meat offered to idols or or the the Jewish dietary laws, whichever one Romans chapter 14 is, is talking about. There are some issues where it's not worth having an argument because God is still glorified by both of the people. If you get up and say baptism is not for not essential to salvation, you are not giving glory to God because you are teaching people how not to be saved and, and trying to lead them down a path which will lead them to destruction. There's no glory to God there. In Romans chapter 14, though, it says everyone's glorifying God with what they're doing. So, now that we have people glorifying God by the things that they're doing, they have honest hearts, and it says... Bear the infirmities of the weak. And here's something very important, not to please ourselves. It's not all about me. It's not all about me. That's the the way we should think. Do we get into discussions with people religiously because we enjoy watching them lose the argument? We enjoy the good feeling that we get when we get them. Yeah, you should have seen you should have seen how I got them. I was having a discussion with so and so and he said this, oh man, I I I opened up on him. Some people enjoy that kind of thing. I don't have Facebook, but my wife does and and Michael does and and sometimes uh they show me you know, you go on the internet and watch people argue. It's horrible. It's horrible. And you can see people who very clearly are not arguing because they want the other person, because they care about the other person's well being. They don't even know the other person. People on the internet have uh, oftentimes a compulsive need to show that they are right. And you get a um, you get a satisfied feeling of that. I don't know if there's a hormone that, that hits your brain, serotonin or something like that, uh, that gives you this satisfied feeling when you show that, that I w- you know, I'm right. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Why do we dispute? Why do we, as Jude 1 verse 3 or as, as the third verse in Jude says, why do we contend earnestly for the faith? Well, because it's under attack. And because if we don't contend, then people will lead others away and souls will be lost. That's why we have disputes. That's why we argue the, the points in Scripture with others so that souls won't be lost. But when that's not on the line, bear the infirmities of the weak. And what you do, don't do it to please yourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. We are building each other up. Now this this passage here reminds me of something that that Paul said to the Philippians in chapter 2. It talks about love. If there be any any consolation in spirit, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. How can you have one mind when some won't eat meat and some will? You can, can't you? Why is that? Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. As Christians, that's what we're trying to do. In this congregation, we have people who are going through difficulty. We have people who are facing their own weaknesses. Who here has a weakness? Raise your, no, don't raise your hand. It's the sermon. It's not Bible class. Also, if I would have asked you to raise your hand, I would expect every single individual to raise it with me. 
Because you have a weakness. Why is that? Well, because Satan knows how to tempt you. And also, we know that just because you are tempted, that does not mean that you are wrong. How do we know this? Because Jesus was tempted. He was tempted like we are in all points, yet without sin. And that's not like us. We were tempted. Satan knows what gets us. And we have to stay strong. And we should build each other up. Romans 15.2 says that we are to do these things for edification. Now we have the example that he gives. This was his, uh, he's, he's concluding Romans chapter 14, and he's talking about how the, that we should work together, building each other up. And who is the best example? Well, Christ is. And in both passages, and they really do look similar, Romans 15 and Philippians 2, both passages say, consider the other person more than yourself because of who considered you before himself. Who did it? For even Christ, it says, pleased not himself. But it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. The reproaches of them who reproached Christ or who reproached God fell on Jesus. What's that mean? The punishment that we deserved fell on Christ. Jesus came to this earth not so that he could be pleased, but he took our punishment. Philippians chapter 2 says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ. For he, let me see here, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And we should have that mind in us, that mind of sacrifice, that mind where we're looking to other people. In Romans 15, it's in the context of... of um, the, the weak brother and the strong brother. But in Philippians, it seems to be a broader context. This seems to be a principle in Scripture then. Uh, what is the context? Well, don't fight about meat offered to idols. How about just don't fight in general? That's what he says here. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. Philippians 2, 3, in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. So what is it that can drive brethren apart? Have we ever witnessed a church split because of personality issues? What about doctrinal issues? If there's doctrinal issues, I can understand a church splitting because of that. You have a bunch of people that will not let go of a, a harmful doctrine. What do you do there? Well, you can work with a congregation for, for a, a time, but maybe there needs to be something like that. Uh, maybe there needs to be a parting of ways in, in that case. But what about personal issues? What about as, as we're so... Um, quick to bring up the color of the walls or the carpet what about fighting people who fight because you know they they want to support this thing and you know there's there's difficulties in in here and, and what what about personality issues where one one tries to be a diatrophies taking control of the church and others resist that you have personality issues in congregations and it can tear people apart 
And if you look at these issues, what you're going to notice in these cases is that people are doing things through strife, through vainglory, and they are esteeming themselves greater than the other person. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification, not yourselves. This is what Jesus did. Finally, if we look at 5, 6, and 7, now Romans 15, 4 is a great verse. He gives his justification for using that, that passage there, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. He's justifying that. He's saying the things that we see in the Old Testament are valuable. But then he continues to make his point here in verses 5 through 7. And, our, and we need to lift up, lift each other up. Do things without strife and glory. And, and what does it create in us would you believe that when I help somebody selflessly I'm actually helping myself would you believe that Jesus says love your enemies do good to them that hurt you pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you can that have a positive benefit if you do that if you heap coals of fire on their head, as, as Romans says, Romans 12 says, can that have a positive benefit? Can that help you when you are good to somebody who is hurting you? What about having an enemy who became your friend? Would that be a good thing? If you could just snap your fingers and say, well, this enemy who is being terrible to me, now they're my friend. Snap your fingers and, and it happens. If you had the choice to do that or say, snap your fingers, never see them again, which would you pick? Would you say, boom, they're gone, or now they're my friend and I love them? And they love me. Which one would you choose if you had the power to do that? And just make it happen at the drop of a hat. You see, when we help each other, when we build each other up, it benefits us. Why? Because it brings us together. And it overcomes differences. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. Like-minded. And here you have two people. One will eat meat, one won't eat meat, yet they're like-minded toward each other. That we with one mind and one mouth glorify God. Even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore, receive one another as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Do you see how we can come together as Christians? And who gets the glory? What is it all for? When we stop fighting and we start unifying in our voice. And notice, unifying even though we have differences. Because Romans 14 and 15 does not command Christians to eradicate all of those differences. One can eat meat, one, or one will eat meat, one won't eat meat. That, that's a difference there. And it doesn't say you need to get rid of those differences. What does he say? He says you need to unify and be one together. Once you do that, you can glorify God with one mind and with one mouth. When we sing praises to God, as a congregation, are there a hundred mouths singing of how we love God, or is there one voice going up to God in heaven? That's the congregation that we need, that one voice. So we stand here today begging each one to consider that. Are you working as a faithful Christian? a follower of God? Have you been baptized into Christ to have your sins washed away? And are we as a congregation promoting this togetherness? If not, 
make it right while we stand and sing our invitation song. Tis a fount of love from the source above, and he bids us all freely drink. Will you come to the fountain free? Will you come? Tis for you and me, thirsty soul, hear the welcome call. Tis a fountain open for all. There's a living well, and its waters swell, and eternal life they can give. Take the Lord's Supper, we'll sing number 752. Why did my, when my love to Christ grows weak? Number 752. When my love to Christ grows weak, when for deeper faith I seek, then in thought I go to Thee, Garden of Gethsemane. There behold His agony, suffered on the Let us pray for the bread. Gracious God, our Father, thank you for this bread that represents your son's broken body. May we take this with the right intent in our heart. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Gracious Father, we pray for this cup, the fruit of the vine that represents your son's blood that was shed for many. In Jesus' name, amen. Now we pray for their offering. Gracious God, our Father, thank you for this offering that's about to be raised and may, be con may continue to be used for the building of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Before our closing prayer, we'll sing number 453.